we need to get rolling for the sake of uh, Steve's time for us this morning. So let me uh, just, uh, there, was, there was a beautiful bio written up about Steve. I just want to read that to you, introduce him to you if you don't know who he is. So just take a minute here, listen. Uh, this is about Steve. For over 25 years, Steve headed the Franklin Group, one of six businesses he has founded since the early 1970s. He sold most of his businesses, uh, business interests and went into full-time ministry. Today, he is a speaker, life skills coach, minister, and author. A newsmaker who has spoken more than 2,000 times at universities, churches, conferences, conventions, nonprofits, businesses, and professional groups. Steve has presented the No Debt, No Sweat live seminar, retooled and refueled essential Christian life skills seminar more than 500 times worldwide. He's a 1974 graduate of what is now Lipscomb University. Steve later taught in the school's business department. As a young man, he preached for a Middle Tennessee church and has since hosted several radio shows, been on the air of life skills and personal finance coach for Fox TV Nashville, a syndicated columnist, author of hundreds of articles, and has written seven books. Steve shares his Christian worldview in fresh, humorous, innovative ways, always with a profoundly biblical focus. Today, Steve is a minister at the Antioch Church of Christ in Nashville. He lives with his best friend and wife of 36 years, Bonnie, in Brentwood, who is here with him somewhere. She may not be in this class. Brentwood, Tennessee. They have four grown children and are really enjoying something that I don't know anything about yet, which is empty nesting. Uh, but I've, I've had the pleasure of uh, meeting Steve and talking with him a little bit. In, in my younger years, I, I was in South Carolina working with a congregation where his sister is married to the preacher. So I was working with, uh, with that congregation when I got to meet and know Steve a little bit better. So I'm not going to take up any more of his time. Let me introduce you to Steve and invite him up here to share this seminar with you. Well, thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for being I, here, Steve. I appreciate it, David. Well, you know, the thing I hate worse than anything, and if any of you get up and leave when I say this, I'm going to be heartbroken. The thing I hate worse than anything is to come to SBIB and show up and find McGuigan is in the room next to me, Billy. <laughs> Billy's one of my buddies. I love him to death. He's had me at various churches that he's been a minister at over the years. And and just, just uh, he's one of the sweetest guys on the planet. But I sure wish he wasn't teaching this hour. <laughs> Listen, I am so happy that those of you that are here have come here. Today, we're going to have a little bit of fun together. I want to talk to you about some things that maybe some of us can identify with. And here's maybe the first question on the agenda. Let me see if I can get this thing working. Here we go. How many of you in here can just go ahead and leave that door wide open? That's okay, it won't hurt anything. How many of you in here can identify with this word right here? How, how many of you are like right now thinking, I've got 97 11 things to do when I get home, right? And, and some of you are thinking, man, I can't wait for this guy to qu quit talking because I've got to make a couple of phone calls, right? Well, some of us not only feel overwhelmed, we actually can identify with this. There's so much on us, so many things hitting us, so many things coming at us. What I'm going to recommend is that maybe we spend a little bit of time and understand some simple principles this morning on leadership. Now, here's my belief. I believe that every one of us on this planet is in one of three categories. We either are a leader, and we know we're a leader. We are a leader, and we don't realize it, but we're leading children. We're leading uh, maybe somebody at work. You know, maybe we're in a mentoring situation. And then the third category are the people who have not yet stepped up to the bar and said, I have something worthwhile that I want to help other people with. That is leadership. And I'm telling you, you will become a better person. You'll become more proficient and efficient at what you do when you step into that leadership role and you begin to really kind of do some of this stuff yourself. So as we get into this, I'm going to suggest that we've all heard the old saying, you know, there's how do you eat an elephant? And the answer is what? One bite, One bite at a time. Right here, right now, today, I want us to talk a little bit about what I call pachyderm pizza. We're going to talk a little bit about how to change some things going forward for the better. Uh, let me go back to the very beginning. In the beginning, I started as a child. <laughs> let me show you a picture of my very, very first girlfriend. There she is. That's my mama. That's me at age one. I was born on uh, July the 3rd, 1952, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, as Herb and Verna's bouncing blue-eyed baby boy, okay? 
And I was absolutely, positively one of the happiest little kids on the planet. That's the way I looked and that's the way I felt. I was a happy guy. Now this, folks, is me today. And I'm, I'm still a very, very happy guy. Very excited to be up and going and, and able to go and do some things. Uh, however, you know, like they say, what really matters is the dash. You know, we look at headstones sometimes and we see the year that the person was born, the year they died. But there's always that dash in between. And that is their life. That is what has gone on. What I want to share with you here are two dates that have changed my life. The very first date was in my junior, my, uh, I should say my senior year in high school. I'll tell you, we'll give you a little context. I'll tell you that from the time I was about seven until I was in the 11th grade, life was not good for me. I'd lost that, that smile that I'd been wearing before then. And it was in those years that... Um, Everything was pretty much upside down in this world. Uh, I was the last kid chosen for basketball. I was the kid who was only informed about the new clubs after they had been formed. And I was the child in the room when somebody would touch me, they'd run and touch someone else and say, that's Steve Diggs' contamination, don't give it back. I would tell you, looking back, that I was probably in a clinical depression for about 10 years there. It was rough. But something happened going into my senior year that changed everything exponentially. I began to realize that in God's eyes, I was, I was an individual who had some value. And I needed to quit worrying about trying to march to other people's drums and listen to the drumbeat, the music in my own life, get away from the noise around me and look for the symphony that there could be. And so my senior year was different. In my senior year, I started a couple of businesses that became pretty profitable. I began performing on radio and television shows around East Tennessee. And gradually, the students that had ridiculed me for so many years, uh, things started to change. But I really wasn't paying much attention to them anymore because, frankly, I wasn't trying to please them. I was trying to do what I felt was right. And I was probably as stunned as anybody on that first day that changed my life. It was June the 4th, 1970, Oak Ridge High School, <coughs> when my senior graduating class, there were about 800 of us in the class, asked me to be the, uh, the commencement speaker. Um, at that point, I realized, you know, Steve, you could do things differently. You, know, you really need to sort of march to your, own, to your own beat. Well, for the next 22 years, things went quite well. I went to college. I tried not to let the classroom get in the way of good education. Uh, during college, I started a bunch of businesses and uh, had a really good run. I mean, it was a lot of fun. After college, began a company out of a shoebox that actually I had started in college, but we, after college was over, uh, this company grew into a multi-story office building on Music Row. It was a pretty large advertising agency and radio and television production company and a number of things. And listen, before any of you jump ahead and think that, oh, what a worldly guy he is, the truth of the matter is there's nothing wrong with the advertising business. It is how it is applied that is wrong in many cases. And I, I couldn't work for somebody else and feel comfortable. So that's a big reason why I started my own firm. We weren't going to sell the sex, greed, and, and, and a lot of the other things. And we weren't going to promote products we didn't believe in. But the point is, over those years, things went great. We won a lot of awards. We had a fabulous staff of people, great clients. But then the second day that changed my life hit. And that day was 22 years after the first one. This was on February the 11th, 1992. I was 39 years old when I found myself being taken into St. Thomas Hospital. And before they let go of me, they had done, count them, five heart bypasses. I was one scared 39-year-old. I mean, here I am with a world-class wife, four of the sweetest little kids that had ever been hatched, a great business, everything was going so well. And here I am with five heart bypasses. And again, it wasn't like I had not asked for the privilege. I mean, I'd done everything wrong. I was eating anything that didn't get off my plate first. Uh, I got like no exercise. I mean, maybe on a good night, I might like roll over in bed. <laughs> but I was doing everything wrong. Coming out of that experience though, I began a transition in my life. And it's taken a number of years for this to completely formulate my brain. But it was then that I began a process in my heart, and this is not my own phrase, but it's I think it speaks well of what, what I'm trying to communicate. I began a process in my own life <clears throat> of wanting to try my best to go from some success in life, hopefully to some true significance in some other people's lives. 
And so with that, a mission was born. I began to look for ways to sell the company. It took about eight years, but in 2000, we sold the business. And at that point, um, my goal was just simply to begin sharing some of the things that I was still then in the pro and I still am today in the process of learning with other people. I went to work on staff at the Antioch Church of Christ in Nashville, where we've been members for, oh, we've been members there since the 70s. Uh, and and um, really the reason I went on staff was because I wanted to start the ministry. Some of you may know about it. It's called No Debt, No Sweat, uh, where we come to, to congregations. I do a seminar called No Debt, No Sweat, and, and we teach God's kids how to use God's money God's way, how to get out of debt, how to give like we should, how to get over some of the greed, and how to really do things differently. Uh, and and uh, I, I'm kind of old-fashioned. I just don't care a lot for these lone wolf ministers that are out here running around with no accountability. So my elders said, well, Steve, we'd be happy for you to come on staff, and we will oversee that ministry. And so that was begun. And then about five or six years ago, we really broadened it. I was doing a lot of speaking to corporations, uh, Walmart, McDonald's, and um, you know, American Airlines, a lot of companies, big companies, a lot of little companies too, a lot of little small companies, a lot of them, teaching leadership concepts. And so while I'm still doing the No Debt, No Sweat seminar all the time all over the country, we just did our 524th seminar two weeks ago in Beaumont. Uh, I'm doing a lot more leadership training now in churches, teaching Christian people the leadership principles that have been, for the most part, taught only in commercial and corporate si situations. So that kind of brings us to where we are right here, right now. What I want to do this morning, I want to share with you what I call the ultimate challenge, building brand new. Every successful corporation out there, and I've worked with a bunch of them, a big part of their success is that they have effectively branded themselves. They've communicated their message in an effective way. And it began to dawn on me a few years ago, well, maybe what people need to do, people maybe need to start doing this individually. Maybe we need to start branding ourselves. Now, I had a young man from AIM when I was doing the AIM uh, orientation here a year or so ago come up to me and he said, Steve, do you think Christians should even be branding themselves? Should it be about us? And that hit me hard because I had apparently miscommunicated what I intended. I'm not talking about something here to build our own ego. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about an epicenter of understanding that people have when they think of you and what they perceive you to be able to do to help them. That's what I'm talking about. So that's what we're going to look at here in just a moment. Before we do that, let me give you a little touch of context. I will tell you that for 25 years I've spent in advertising talking a whole bunch about branding. And here's what I've learned. I've learned that over the, year, that over the years I've learned that Every successful brand is built on two things, the look and the hook. Now, what I mean by that is this. Virtually every successful company out there begins with a visual. This is usually the way they build their structures. Maybe it's, the, maybe it's that logo, that mark that they use everywhere. That becomes what we visually think of when we think of that company. And every successful company that I know of also has a slogan line, a tagline, or maybe you can call it a hook line. Usually this is just a few words that in a quick way kind of communicate a benefit to the people that come to buy their stuff. For instance, when you see this particular M, you don't think L-M-N-O-P, right? What do we think of? McDonald's. Yeah, McDonald's is one of the most successful companies on the planet. And what is their hook line right now? It's, I'm loving it. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means what it needs to mean to whomever is reading it. If you're a mom and you've got three crumb crunchers in the back seat, you're rushing to church on Wednesday night, you don't have time to to make supper, you throw a bag of burgers back there and you're loving it. Uh, you've got a 12 year old teenage, uh, almost teenage son, he wants to have a birthday party. But every time his friends come over to the house, they trash the place. You go to McDonald's on Saturday, have a birthday party there, <laughs> you're loving it. Your wife or your husband's out of town, it's late at night, you're bored. You go down to McDonald's at 10 o'clock, get a cup of coffee and sit there and do some people watching. You're loving it. You see, it can mean what it needs to mean to the person. Here's another logo, and by the way, I am not a supporter of this company in any way, and if you want to talk about it after it's over, I'll tell you why, but they do a good job with their branding. We see a lot of bull guys, but when we see this particular one, what do we think of? Target. Yeah, Target. And let me show you something. When a company does its branding very well, we do a lot of the work for them. For instance, here is a gift card from some company. Does anybody have any guess whose gift card that is? Target. Well, how do you know that? I mean, it doesn't say Target on there anywhere, does it? 
I don't think it's even on it's on the back. No, it's not it's nowhere. <laughs> Target's not on there anywhere. How do we know that? It's, I'm saying they branded themselves to the point that when we see, see those colors and that look, we think Target. And by the way, this is the way great TV advertising happens. You usually start with a 30 second commercial, you run it and 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 run it, till people get all of the concepts from that 30, all the promises in that 30 into their mind. Then you whack the 30 down to a 10 second commercial. Why do you do that? Because 10 second commercials only cost 50% as much to run as 10 seconds. But you see when a person in the audience now sees that 10 second, they read all of the 30 seconds back into it. Or all the thoughts from the 30 seconds, I should say, back into it. This is how great branding happens. There's an insurance company out there. They tell us that they're like a good neighbor. Who is that? State Farm. No, State Farm. There's another one out there. They say, hey, we're the good hands people. Anybody know who this is? Allstate. Allstate. Of course, you miss a payment or two and those good hands <laughs> open up and you go right through the Bible. That's another point. <laughs> Here's the deal. Here's the deal. What we want to do this morning, to the degree we have time, I want to share with you what I'm calling a lightning. Because I'm going to go fast. You probably already noticed that I'm running at about 800 words a minute with gust up to about 1,000. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've got so much to share with you and so little time to do it in. So it's going to be like trying to drink from a fire hydrant. <laughs> but I'm going to share some things with you here this morning. Uh, and in all, I hope to share a total of 24 keys to building an ethical lifestyle and a ferociously, this says, successful business. I would translate that here to say a ferociously successful ministry. And folks, let's be real clear about this. Everybody in this room, if you're really a Christian, you are a minister, right? Amen? Amen. Yeah. Now, I've got some elders in here and some, some uh, ministers, and that's swell. And, and ladies, don't ever feel diminished about this. When I come to churches, I do a, a thing at churches called the Leadership Summit. And, and uh, when we first started doing this, I used to tell the churches used to ask me, and we'd talk about it. And I'd say, well, let's just do it with the uh, elders and, and the minister. And we realized that was foolish. So but then we started doing it with all the guys. And then it really wasn't me that did it. I was out in California. By the way, you talk about conservative congregations. They're the most conservative in the country out there. You don't know that. Pepperdine is, is different. But, I mean, everybody else does. But I was out there with a friend of mine, Richard Birch, at his church. And, and Richard said, well, Steve, why are we inviting the ladies to come? And he said, and I said to him, I said, I don't know. He said, well, they're leading the night. I mean, they're, they're teaching children's classes. They're leading the ladies' classes. Why not? So now we just do these things for the whole church. But in that leadership summit, these are some of the things that we teach. Um, a, a few of these. Most of these are not in the leadership summit. But at any rate, with that said, I want to share with you, if time allows, a total of these two sessions of 28 of these concepts. So to begin with, let's just remember what the Bible says about this. For the Lord gives wisdom. And from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So the answer to this is if any of us lacks wisdom, let us ask of God. God is the one who gives generously to all without any reproach. And the Bible says when we ask for it, it will be given to us. By the way, there's a huge difference between wisdom and knowledge. Are we aware of that fact? Okay. I mean, there are a lot of knowledgeable people out there that are not very wise. The difference between wisdom and knowledge is that knowledge is what tells me that tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is what tells me, I don't want to put a tomato in a fruit salad. Okay, <laughs> you've heard that. But that's, that's kind of the thing. So, I'm just going to start and be bold with the very first one. If you're going to be successful in your ministry, don't be stupid. Now, what do you mean by that one, Steve? Here's what I mean by that. There are a lot of godly people out here that, that because we tend to do things God's way and we try to live moral lives, we just sort of suppose that everybody else is going to respond the same way. Jesus talked about this very thing. He told his followers to be as wise as snakes, but as meek and innocent as doves. And that's key to everything. Christians, we do nobody any favor by being stupid. We do nobody any favor by being naive. We, as God's kids, need to really know how the world ticks and how it shakes out. Many of you have heard the story. I call it a parable of the stone. And this goes back to about 200 years in our, in our country's history. Very early part of our country's history, this is a small hamlet up in the northeastern uh, part of the nation. And in this hamlet lived a cobbler. He was a sweet man. Everybody in town loved him. He made the shoes for about everybody that lived in town as well. But this cobbler had a problem. He was not a great businessman, and he'd gotten himself into a lot of debt. Brother, just come on in and grab a chair. He got himself into a whole lot of debt. 
And, and it was early in the morning one morning when there was a banging at his door. Boom, 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 boom. The cobbler comes and he opens the door. And standing out here on the street corner is, is the town lender. This guy is a grubby, greedy old man that rips people off. And he's standing on the sidewalk and he's yelling at the cobbler saying, I want my money and I want it now. And with that, the cobbler looks at him and says, but sir, I, I don't have your money yet. I will pay you next week. But with that, the, the, the lender steps back and the two thugs that were on either side of him step forward. They grab the copper, drag him out into the street, throw him on the ground. And with that, the lender begins to berate him in front of all the people. Well, the cobbler's daughter is still inside the shop. She can't take this any longer. She runs out. She stands between her father on the ground and the lender. And she looks at the lender and she says, sir, what have we got to do to appease you? And with that, the lender looks at her and says, so young lady, you want to get involved here? Very well. You can be one of two things. You can either turn around right now and go back in that shop and I will take the house, I will take the shop, and I will take the money. Or if you wish, I'll bend down and I'll pick up two stones. I'll pick up a brown, a, a black stone and a white stone. And I'll put both of them in my money bag. You look inside my bag, you pull out one of the stones. If you pull out the white stone, then all is forgiven. All is forgotten, I leave with nothing. But if you pull out that black stone, I will get the shop, I will get the house, I will get the money, and you, young lady, will become my bride. But before she could even think, the old man was bent down picking out the stone. But she's paying attention, and she notices that instead of a black stone and a white stone, he's actually picking up two black stones. So thinking very quickly, she says, sir, I'll take you up on that. And he reaches inside of his bag, pulls out one of the black stones, but before anybody can see it, she lets it drop. It instantly mingles back with all the stones on the ground. And she looks at the old man and she says, sir, I have dropped my stone. But please reach inside your bag, pull out the remaining stone and show it to all to see. Then surely they will know the color of the stone that I pulled out. <laughs> Well, the old man knew that he'd been had, but he was too embarrassed to admit what he had done. So that day, he went home with no money, no shop, no house, and no bride. Dear Christians, is my point. We have got to be smart people. We've got to be intelligent. And we cannot assume that everybody around us thinks the way we do. And this is one of the reasons why I encourage Christians to be people never of, of anger, never hard-hearted people at all, but be people who are prepared to do right things in tough situations. Right now, the Antioch Church, we're doing a lot of practical training. We're a church of about 500 folks still, and, uh, and next to some of the Texas churches, we're probably as heavily armed as about any church in the country. Yeah. And, 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 and again, we hope nothing ever happens, but we do have our goal, our mission is protecting our people ahead of some evil person. So this is just part and of my judgment of what it takes to be a great leader. Number two, if you're going to lead successfully, you've got to learn to em embrace what I call alternative success. What is that? Well, this is a phrase that I began using some years ago because it dawned on me, I began to realize this in my own life, that in most cases, our concept of success early on is not very good for us. Most of us tend to chase our passions when we should be chasing our abilities. And a lot of people start on paths towards success, and when those things don't work out, they get so demoralized, so frustrated, in many cases, they never come back again for error. And they never really step into other opportunities. Here's what I'm talking about. My first lesson in success came way back in the early 1970s. Um, and in those years, and I don't know why in the world, but I had it in my brain that I would not be happy, I would not be successful if I did not get into show business. So I went out and I did all the show business things. I did the radio shows and I had a radio, uh, did some TV stuff and sang around and, and actually I got to hang out with some pretty cool people, Elvis and some people like that. And eventually I actually signed contracts with what was then one of the largest record labels on the planet. But there was a teensy weensy itty bitty problem. <laughs> at all I'm telling you I'm not being modest here I cannot see my records did not sell I mean there was this one little old lady up in Des Moines and she dropped one in the store and she broke it and they made her pay for it but, but, <laughs> but I was a terrible singer so the label being the label they dropped me 
And I'm telling you something, I went through a terrible season for about three years there. I was depressed, I was demoralized. I didn't think that anything would ever work again for me. It was crazy. But finally, finally, when I began to lean back, you know, the Bible talks about how we have our bits. You know, in Proverbs, we're told to bring up a child in the way that he should go, and then he's old and won't depart from it. You know, that in the way he should go, that has to do with an idea that every person that God has ever constructed has a bent, a certain way to go. And that's why parents have to be very careful. If you've got more than one kid, they're going to have different bents. And it's your job to get ahead of the curve, figure out where that bent is, and lead it in the most godly way possible. That's what parents are supposed to be doing. God has given us all bent. And I began to realize, and God started opening some doors for me, was what happened that maybe I did not need to be in that part of the studio. You see, in Nashville, we have studios on every corner, and there's not much to a recording studio. I mean, there's like two big rooms. There's a room over here where the singers and the musicians are, and that's where I wanted to be. And then there's this big glass wall, and over here is the control room where the producer and the engineer sit. Well, again, I was really frustrated when I didn't get to be in this room. But when I began to lean back and let God open some doors, it was amazing how he lifted me up and brought me over to the other side of the glass. Um, that, you know, that, that changed my life. That was the beginning of our business right there. By the way, this man right here, some of you might recognize him. His name is Scotty Moore. Scotty was the fellow that I used to hire as I became a producer. I hired him to do a lot of my engineering and studio things. Uh, Scotty was a well-known, very good producer in Nashville those, in those years, and he was a good friend of mine. Uh, if you don't recognize him here, I might tell you that 10 years earlier, he had been Elvis, 15 years earlier, he'd been Elvis Presley's lead guitarist. That's kind of how he got known. A few years ago, Scotty sent me this picture, and this thing still hangs on my wall at home uh, in my office. But as you can see, that's a picture with you know Elvis on the right and, and uh, uh, DJ and Bill Black, the other musicians, and Scotty there in the middle. But Scotty wrote an inscription on here that I still love. Steve, I worked with you, and I worked with Elvis. I'm glad that one of you made it. <laughs> and I, I know what he was doing. He was kind of pulling my leg a little bit there. But honestly, I feel like I made it. Not on this side of the glass, but over here on this side of the glass. And to me, that's fundamental. We have to embrace, we have to embrace alternative success. But the question is, how do we do this? Well, the way we do this is by playing to our God-given strengths. You know, advertisers, branding uh, companies that do branding understand this very well. For instance, you never would expect Walmart to come on, on air with advertising saying, you know, we're selling the highest quality jewelry in America. Come on down and get yourself some. Really? No, they're not. No, we know better. We know that Walmart sells good, middle class, middle price jewelry at a good low price. That is their story. That is their brand. But on the other hand, Saks Fifth Avenue, if they came on air saying, hey, come on down to the store today. We're selling the cheapest wristwatches in America. Get 12 for each arm. Really? No. They are selling very high end, very exclusive jewelry at commensurate prices. And you see, this is the thing. We've got to know what our strengths and what our weaknesses are and play, in every case, to our strengths. This kind of illustrates what I'm talking about. Way back in the 1950s, there was essentially, for all practical purposes, one car rental company in America, and that company was Hertz. It, when a person got off the airplane, they would automatically, if they needed a rental car, they would go to the Hertz counter. And Hertz dominated the market. I mean, they had these big glitzy TV commercials where people would fly into the car as the jingle would sing, let Hertz put you in the driver's seat. They had these big full-color magazine and newspaper ads with stars of the day in them. And this was how they dominated the market. But there was technically another car rental company. Technically, they were number two. But Avis was so far back in the pack that practically nobody had ever even heard of it. And Avis had the dubious distinction of having lost money for the last five consecutive years. I mean, they were in a world of hurt. And, and, and they didn't know how to deal with it. They didn't know how to get past it. Well, finally, they scrounged together a million dollars, and they began shopping for ad agencies. And what they were saying is, hey, we got a million dollars. Will you give us a multi-million dollar campaign? And everybody was turning them down until they ran across what was then a very small New York shop named Dale, Don Don and Burnmark. And when it came to Dale, Don and Burnmark, the guys listened to them, and they answered. They said, yeah, we'll do it provided one thing. That is that you let us 
make all the decisions. Well, Avis didn't have much to lose, so they said, okay, go ahead. And with that was born one of the most successful advertising campaigns of the 20th century. You see, up until that point, every advertiser out there made it their business to claim to be the biggest, the most bombastic, the, the best in their field. That's the way advertising was done. We're the biggest, we're the best, you know, all that came out. Well, Avis, for the first time, came out with a brand new campaign where they said two things. They said, hey, we're number two. And then they followed it up with a promise. But we'll try that. And do you know what happened? Almost immediately, America's love for the underdog kicked in. And Avis supported this with lots of advertising that spoke the same thing. Their advertising was not full of <coughs> It was very simple. One on the left, you know, a big fish eating a little fish saying, hey, when you're number two, you try harder or else over there on the right. Are you working like a dog to get to the top? Well, then shake hands with Avis. I mean, this was their advertising, and it spoke that kind of gritty look that they were, they were coming across with. And the cool thing is, it worked. People began <coughs> stepping over from the Hertz line into the Avis line. And for about 40 years, Avis was on a growth cycle like nobody has ever seen. They no longer say that they're number two. They just simply say, hey, we try hard. You see, this is the way we, we, we play to our strengths. And this is what we've got to do if we're going to succeed as individuals or if we're going to succeed in our ministries. Don't sit back and worry about some other church in town that has better music or that's bigger or smaller or, or whatever. We have our congregation, our family to fall in love with and to build from. And this is why we all need to be better leaders with those people. We don't need to buy the lie. You know, in our culture today, every millennial out there, no offense to the millennials, thank you, you guys are the ones who, who engineered and created the selfie stick, okay? But <laughs> I'm kidding. I should have, I've got four kids here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Some of the brightest people I know are millennials. <laughs> I've got four, student, four kids that are all millennials. Uh, and by the way, our son is the senior minister at the Antioch Church of Christ, where I work, okay? And that, if you do the math, that means he's my boss. <laughs> and, and I love it. So, so anyways, but our culture, though, is telling us a lot of lies. And one of those is, hey, if you want to have a great life, follow your passions. How many of you have heard some derivative of that? I mean, it's everywhere. Well, folks, that's, that's crazy. You know, your passions you know, on all levels, you follow your passions and you can get into a lot of trouble, right? The trick is to follow your strengths. Figure out what your strengths are. And then become passionate about those strengths. God didn't order you want to have all the, all the talent. If he had, we, our heads would be too big to get in this room. We all have a little bag of things that we can do okay, and a big bag of things that we know good. And that's just the truth. And we need to sit that way and accentuate those things that we can really do and get excited about that. Here's the fourth concept. We need to become, as God's kids, courageous people. And if you've not read the, the Chronicles of Narnia recently, the Witch in the Wardrobe, uh, what is it, the Witch, the Lion, 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 okay, you know what I'm talking about. You need to read that, because that is, that is a story of what I'm saying right here. We need to become much more courageous than we are. The Bible talks about this. Have I not commanded you? Be strong, be courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That's a promise from God. You know, the dictionary says that courage is the state or quality of mind or spirit that enables one to face fear and danger with these three things. Self-possession, confidence, and resolution. In another word, courage <clears throat> is bravery. And Christians, we're called to be brave. And of all the people on this planet, we have every reason to be brave. Because we know how, to, how it's all going to end. We know. We don't have anything really here to fear. And we need to act and walk and talk that way. Our culture is desperately searching for courageous leaders. And these are people that step up, they say what they mean in a very clear way, and they do what they say. And the reason they do this is because they put value in doing the right thing. It's just that simple. It's the right thing to do. I'm going to do the right thing. Why am I going to do the right thing? Because I put value in it. And you don't have to explain that. You don't have to excuse yourself to anybody who is that way. You just call it as you see it. You try your best not to be blind so you, so you see things correctly, but you talk it as you see them, and then you stay true to what you said. And there's very, very few people doing that. Now, I want to talk to you and bring you into the next point on decision making. To do that, though, can we all agree that we've made a few bad decisions in here? Yeah. 
Can anybody identify with this? Billy admits, though they even exist, or is it just a made up word to destroy our dreams? Thanks to you, Order Book, the most powerful old spice anti parchment in the world, I was free of Sweat's tyrannical rule over my body, and I could push myself even further. Should I stop? Should I have listened to all the critics? Should I have taken even a basic ground level engineering course of some type? Yes. Yes, I should have. <laughs> but the most valuable lesson I have ever learned is that if you fill your brain with knowledge, then there won't be any room for dreams. And my dream is to take the wheel and try to Can we relate to that? We've all made a few bad decisions. So let's talk a little bit about this. We can get that off there. Come on. Come on. There we go. Yeah, we've all made a few bad decisions. So here's the question. And here's the thought that we might look at. A way to avoid bad decisions is to make all of your decisions backstage. What does that mean? Which one of me? Exactly, you don't practice on stage. All good decisions, listen carefully, all good decisions are made before prime time in the quiet of your dressing room when the pressure is not on and you have the time and the space to make decisions based on two things, your core beliefs and your moral code. If you wait until the situation arises and you're in the heat of the moment, the passions are flowing, you're gonna make bad decisions. This is why God's people aren't supposed to be dumb people, back to what I said early on, right? This means that we need to be the people who pre-act so we don't spend our lives having to react to everything. This means that we think ahead. I mean, if you're, how many of you in here have been in sales? Raise your hands, any of you have been in sales? Okay, you know one of the first things they teach in sales is that you need to anticipate the objections, you know what I mean? You need to anticipate what could go wrong, or what a person might say negative about the product so you know what to say. And any good salesman has, has ready answers to virtually every objection that can come up. If he doesn't, then he's not really worthy to be doing the job. It's real simple. And this is the hard work where you learn, you study, you think through these things. And you first off, make sure you have a product that is legitimate. And then you can explain to people when they're concerned about something, why that concern can be mitigated. That's what, what it's all about. Well, it seems to me that we Christians, if we really believe we have the most important message there is, Maybe it behooves us to get better at pre-planning, at sitting down and just spend time in thought and in prayer, thinking, okay, this is something that I know is down the road. Now, what could go wrong? Troubleshoot. And what's going to happen if they want me to do this or do that? And what am I going to say? That's when we build our decision. That's when we make our calls. So then when we're in the situation itself, it's just rote. We just, boom, we know what we're going to say. And there's no emotion. We just simply do what we're going to do. It changes things in the way we look at life. Um, number six, great leaders are the individuals who hide the wires. Okay, there's another one of those weird things. What does that mean? Here's what I mean. Nobody likes complication. And great leaders are the ones who understand that your job is, is to decomplicate crowbars. In other words, do not make the people who are coming behind you have to go through hardships and, and heartache in order to accomplish things, when you can clean the path out in front of them. That is a big part of leadership. In other words, hide the wires. Take away the confusion so that the people who are following you can, can, really, can really go on towards greatness. I mean, companies and organizations that understand this do very well with it. Some companies and some organizations have hidden the wires and have, have been very, very successful. Others haven't. Uh, for instance, here's one. MasterCard has been incredibly successful at hiding the wires. If you go to Starbucks and you swipe your card for a $5 cup of coffee, you walk out the door, it's easy peasy, no problem at all, it's all done. But the second you do that, man, this massive set of algorithms kicks in, debits, ledgers are being hit back and forth, but you don't know anything about that, you don't care, it's all being done behind the curtains. The wires have all been hidden. 
Now, on the other side, there's another entity out there, Bitcoin. Anybody heard about Bitcoin? Okay. Now, by the way, I'm not up here recommending that you buy or sell or do anything with that. I'm just simply saying Bitcoin is a cool concept, and it's based on the blockchain theory. And blockchain, by the way, is probably what we're going to be seeing in the coming years for most of our money transactions and most of our contractual uh, transactions. I mean, it's coming, and there's nothing good or bad about it. It's just a new, a new model. And whether Bitcoin will last through that or not, who knows? But the trouble with Bitcoin right now is when I go to the Starbucks and I buy that $5 cup of coffee and 32 cents of tax, I cannot swipe my phone and pay a fraction of a Bitcoin. It's just not there yet. Now, there are companies like Lightning that are trying to make that doable, and I think they probably <coughs> will, will sooner or later they'll manage to do that. But right now, Bitcoin is not hitting its waters. So today, when you buy lunch, what are you going to use, MasterCard or Bitcoin? Okay. And that's my point. Our job as leaders is to hide the wires for the people that are following behind us. Number, and by the way, are you all tracking okay with this? Is, this? is this okay, what we're doing here? Am I going too fast? Or, oh, okay. Number seven, let's talk a little bit about not getting lost in the weeds. And this is the way a lot of leaders fail. A lot of leadership is undermined because the leader, he or she themselves, gets lost in the weeds. In other words, as a leader, <clears throat> your job is to be a vision caster. That means once you have brought people to a new level, it is not your job to get settled in and start to kind of look around the weeds. It is your job to begin plotting out strategies to reach for the next plateau. Don't ever settle for where you're at. And again, I'm not saying don't be, be uh, uh, content. You know, the scriptures tell us to be content, and we should be. And there's no lack of contentment for the individual. There can be, I guess. I mean, if you pervert it, and, and it's, a, it's a stressful, driven lifestyle. That's not what I'm talking about. But the truth is, great leaders are the ones who are inspired, they're motivated, they're excited, they're happy to look for great new opportunities. And we should never get so old that we don't do this. And, and I routinely come to churches uh, and when we're doing the leadership summit. And this is something we have to kind of work through with everybody. Because we have people, some of them are the oldest Christians in the church, who just simply do not want to, to think about what can be. And, and it's not because they're bad or evil at all. It's just because that is not in their wheelhouse of the way they think. So this is important. Great leaders need to be vision catchers. Where there is no vision, the uh, Proverbs tells us, that people are going to perish. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. These are plans of welfare, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Great leaders. They're vision catchers, but they are also... They're also people who are able to take that next step. And that becomes really, really hard for most people. Most people like to settle. Most people like to get where they're at and get relaxed with it. The sociologists used to say that it took 23 to 24 years for there to be broad societal change on things. They're now telling us that that broad societal change is happening every six to seven years. We have to understand that things change quickly these days. And we need to be prepared to change along with them. You know, a lot of things happen but there's no follow-up. For instance, ice cream was actually invented back in 2000 BC. They didn't come up with the ice cream cone until 1880. Here's another one. Baked meat, or, or cooked beef and baked bread. People were eating these at least by 2600 BC. However, it was not until 1400 AD, let me get it up here, when somebody came up with the idea of the meat sandwich. <laughs> Here's another one. Did you know that the flush toilet is one year older than the nation? It was invented in 1775, but it was more than 80 years later when somebody came up with the idea of... That was one 80-year period when you didn't want to shake hands with anybody. <laughs> you see, we have to be people who are ready and who are excited to go on to the next step. That's the bottom line. The first step to vision casting is to get out of the weeds and to remain focused on what really, really counts. Now, we are going to break huddle right now. Let's see, is it time to? What time do we have here? Do we have 10 more minutes? Is that? Is that well, let's, let's do this next one, okay? One of the most important things, and brother, if you want to close that door, that'd be great. Um, one of the most important things that any leader can do, absolutely, is to understand that we have a finite amount of time. And as God's kids, it is our job to use this gift that God has given us well. This means that we have to be people who kill the time keepers. Everything you do falls into one of three categories. There are the nows, 
There are the necessaries, and then there are the needs. What are the next? The now are the things that we have to do right this minute. No ifs, ands, or buts. You're driving down the road, you're tuning the radio, the car blows a tire. Right now, you forget about the radio. Your job right now is to get this thing off the road and get it stopped. The necessaries, these are things that have to be done, but they don't have to be done right now. I mean, you can do it at nine in the morning, you can do it three this afternoon. It doesn't make too much difference. Now, the needs, this is where people get, and where we can get ourselves into trouble. The needs are the things we really love to do. Nothing wrong with them inherently. But what most of us do is we focus on these and we let these go. Mm -hmm. And that's how we lead an unsuccessful life. And we're not a good witness, by the way, to the people in the world who live like this. So, how do we do this? How do we take control of our time? I'm going to share with you a couple of thoughts. This is some material that, <clears throat> that I've done for Hilton and for uh, FedEx. And, and it's, it's just just a tip of the iceberg of what we teach, but a couple of thoughts that might, you know, re, re encourage us. Number one, if you're going to control your time, you have got to have a written plan for your time. I don't care whether, I, I don't care whether we're, we're talking about, a, you know, a new law or a constitution of a nation or a time plan. It's nothing more than just a bunch of free floating ideas out in open space until we put them on paper. We've got to write it down. And I don't care how you do that. You can do it with a fancy pad, you can do it with a yellow pad, or you can do it with an iPad, but you gotta write it down. And let me tell you exactly how this looks and exactly what we should do. First thing we're gonna do is understand that every day as that day progresses, and as we think of things that we need to do tomorrow, we're gonna to stop long enough to write that down. Every day, at the end of that day, five minutes before we leave the job situation, we are going to sit there and think and put more things on that list for tomorrow. Finally, what you're going to do is you're going to prioritize those things. This is job one, that's job two, and have all of that ready. Then we're going to keep the list with us. That way, if we decide that we may want to stay up later than we should tonight, we just look at our list and say, nope, I've got to get up early in the morning. I don't have time for this. We have to have a written list. And I can tell you, pardon me, I can tell you, I'm 65 years old, and to this day, I still have a written list every single morning before I crawl out of bed. I do, and I'm telling you, it has changed my life in radical ways. Well, there's one other thing to remember, and this is the great steroid of time management. Eat your problems for breakfast. In other words, most of us on, on any given day, we have at least one job that we just do not want to do. We've got to go and clean that nasty workspace. We have to have that phone call with somebody that's going to be really tough, or that meeting that we don't look forward to. And what do we do? What do we do usually? We, yeah, we put it off, we put it off, we put it off. And all day long, whether we're conscious of it or just, it's maybe it's just subconscious, we have this kind of black cloud over our head. We're kind of feeling down, kind of bummed out. The whole day is sort of a drag. And then what do you do? At the end of the day, when you absolutely have to get it done, you go ahead and do it. And then you go home to the people you love the very most in a bad frame of mind. What if we roll back the tape? And what if we did it this way? What if in the morning I eat my problems for breakfast? I pick out that rotten job that I least want to do, and I kill that sucker dead. I drive a stake in the cart, then I go on. You know what happens? Suddenly we have this sense of empowerment, we have this sense of control, we have this sense of joy. We don't have anything bad to look forward to. The day is great, the day is on an up uphill in swing all day long, and we go home happy. It changes the very nature of our being. And for many people, their depression comes from things of this sort, little manipulative things that we can do for ourselves that will change every bit of it. And also, we need to remember this. Snooze alarms are for... <laughs> Don't ever hit that snooze alarm. I'm telling you, that is the worst thing you can do because, again, what you're doing when you hit the snooze alarm is you're breaking the last promise you made to yourself last night. You're saying, hey, my word doesn't mean anything. There's nothing flexible. And that is a terrible subconscious thing to build in. Because it doesn't cost you a long start. Don't ever touch the snooze alarm. That will mess you up. Okay, we're going to break huddle. And when we get back, I want to talk to you about the B.O. approach. Okay? Not what you're thinking. <laughs> uh, we'll take about, um, okay, we'll take about 10 minutes or 15, and we'll be back in here at 11, maybe a couple minutes before. That's <laughs> what I'm doing. <laughs>
here's okay, so uh, the second uh, part. Hey, folks, before you leave, let me just mention something before I forget it. We have some books. Uh, this is, I just want you to know about this. this. This is a brand new book called Fast Barber Leadership. It goes deeper into this. It's a full-color book. This is a $17 book. We have some copies as long as we have them. You can get one for seven dollars if you like. Also, we have this book. If you happen to be in or around sales to get the green light, this is a cool little book. And this one also is